Hello, good evening. My name is Michael Awad, and I'm uh, pleased to be your host for the SAGE's AppSite webinar part two. Uh, we're so glad to have you all, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. We have a really terrific program lined up for you, and uh, uh, we know everybody's busy, so we're particularly appreciative of you being here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll introduce all of our panelists as we um, get to that section. Uh, we had part one back in uh, December for those of you that were able to join us. And so uh, if you uh, uh, were uh, terrific, if not, uh, it was recorded and is on the uh, SAGES uh, website uh, where you can review part one uh, back from December of 2020 if you'd like. At that time, we discussed a number of GI topics, uh, which we'll uh, go over here shortly. So again, we've got a terrific uh, program for you. Part two was added uh, last year as part of popular demand. We heard from you all that you wanted to hear about even more app site review topics. So we created a second app site webinar and we're doing it again this year based on um, uh, your feedback. So again, my name is Michael A. Watt. I'm a mentally invasive surgeon at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I also chair what's known as the Resident and Fellow Training Committee as part of SAGES, which is the primary uh, committee responsible for uh, uh, resident education and what's put on this uh, webinar for the last six years. We're so pleased uh, to have over 2,000 registrants for these webinars every year from over 25 countries around the world. So we're particularly excited about having uh, this for you all. Our topics this evening are going to include surgical critical care and trauma by Dr. Ivy Haskins, uh, breast and endocrine review by Dr. Amy Rosenbluth, a variety of topics including transplant thoracic pediatrics plastics uh, by Dr. Sarah Hennessy, and vascular surgery by Dr. Jerry Fortuna. One of the things that, um, again, we want to just uh, take a moment to acknowledge is the uh, society that sponsors these webinars, which is the Society of American Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons, or SAGES. SAGES is a phenomenal surgical society. I've been uh, pleased to be a part of for almost 20 years now. Um, SAGES is a really robust organization of uh, uh, surgeons and endoscopists throughout the world. Um, it's a, really a society that has sponsored my own uh, surgical career. It's a tremendous network of colleagues and partners that I've, I've really come to, to know, including the folks on this call um, here today. Uh, some of you may be SAGES members already. For those of you who are not, we strongly encourage you to consider uh, looking at SAGES membership. For candidate members, it's... Uh, uh, a very low cost to be able to join, and it entitles you to uh, significant discounts for the annual meeting, which this year is going to be in Las Vegas, Nevada. We look forward to being able to hopefully see each other in person again uh, when that time comes. I also want to acknowledge our partner society, the Surgical Council of Resident Education, or SCORE. Many of you uh, are familiar with SCORE as the really national curriculum uh, that has a portal with uh, surgical education content, quiz questions, and more. SCORE has kindly uh, provided the questions that we'll be sharing with you uh, this evening. These are questions that are actually uh, not even released yet in the SCORE portal, so many of these you'll be seeing for the first time. This is the app site content outline. Um, these are the, uh, shows the, all the topics that are included in the app site every year. And it's broken down by the weighting uh, that you'll see. Um, we're gonna be focusing on the patient care category, which is 72% of the app site. In part one, which we had in December, we focused on the abdomen and alimentary tract as well as flexible endoscopy. This evening, we're going to be focusing on the topics that I described. Between the two uh, app sites, you'll be covering almost three quarters of the questions um, and about uh, 160 questions total between the, the two app sites. So we're really, really pleased uh, to be able to offer this. 
So the format uh, which we found to be uh, successful is kind of multiple choice questions in an audience response system. Um, these will all be given within Zoom and uh, we will read a question. You'll have uh, you know, about 20 seconds or so to answer the question via the poll that will come up on your screen. And then we'll see the results of the respondents and we'll discuss each of those questions. Um, it will, uh, in addition, we will have a Q&A as part of the Zoom that comes up. Um, if we, we won't use the chat feature, but you can use the Q&A that is on the bottom of your screen as part of Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put that in there. We will do our best to get to the questions either verbally or typed out, but we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Um, finally, uh, we will have a poll at the end of the webinar, where uh, our survey that is, where we're gonna ask you for some feedback and um, we really would appreciate it if you can take 30 seconds to give us feedback so we can uh, make improvements for the future. And one final note, if you're watching this webinar on a mobile device, such as a smartphone, uh, the poll question will overlap the entire uh, question stream. And so um, you can just simply hit back to go back to the questions, and then you can open up the poll again. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, it's my distinct pleasure to, to uh, reintroduce to you Dr. Ivy Haskins. Dr. Haskins is currently at the University of Nebraska and has really uh, been a tremendous part of the resident fellow training committee and one of the um, uh, faculty on our webinar this evening. Dr. Haskins, uh, welcome, great to see you and thank you so much for being here. Um, so uh, I'm gonna bring up the uh, first question here and um, Dr. Haskins, uh, please take it away. And uh, you might be muted there. Uh, let's see, I don't think we have your audio. Oops, I gave it away a little bit. Um, uh, Ed, uh, if you could just uh, touch base with Dr. Haskins about her audio, I will go ahead and um, uh, just go ahead and start reading the question. We do have a lot of questions and we're gonna move pretty quickly uh, through those. But um, uh, uh, Ed, if you can check in with Dr. Haskins as to the uh, audio issue there. So our first question is a 20-year-old man who is found face down and unresponsive in a dorm by his roommate. He is brought to the emergency department where is observed he is maintaining his airway and breathing spontaneously. What is the appropriate initial intervention for this patient? A, administer morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. B, administer calcium gluconate, insulin, albuterol, and capsulate. C, intubate the patient, hyperventilate, and administer mannitol. D, administer thiamine, dextrose, naloxone, flumazenil. And e, or E, consult a neurosurgeon for cranial decompression. And the poll is coming up now. Hi, can you hear me now? We can, yes. Okay. Sorry, I just rejoined. So you should have a poll uh, come up on your screen and uh, please uh, go ahead and answer B, your poll it should come up on your smartphone as well. And while people are answering, Dr. Haskins, thank you again and uh, uh, so glad to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Okay, I'm gonna pull up the first answer. Good, so it looks like ev almost everybody got this one correct. So the key points to answering 
Um, this question is that the patient is maintaining his airway and there's no information in the question stem to heighten your suspicion for trauma. Um, just a quick review, clomazinil helps reversal of benzodiazepines and naloxone is used for um, opioid overdose. A living male, excuse me, a living male liver donor presents with fever and right upper quadrant pain five days status post right hepatectomy. He is hemodynamically stable. He has a white blood cell count of 13,000 and a serum total bilirubin of 4.9. A liver ultrasound demonstrates an eight centimeter fluid flexion on the cut surface of the remnant liver. What is the most appropriate initial management strategy? A, initiation of antibiotics and percutaneous drainage of the fluid flexion. B, aspiration of the fluid flexion in endoscopic retrograde calandrial pancreatography with biliary stent placement. C, initiation of antibiotics and percutaneous transhepatic calandrography. And D, or D, re expiration and washout. Dr. Haskins, while we're waiting for people to answer, do you have any tips um, on the actual app site when you have kind of a lung stem like this? Questions with the lung stem? Yeah, I mean, I think looking at kind of the key, trying to identify some key words. So it's a male living donor um, and he has a fluid collection after a liver surgery. Um, typically kind of looking for those key words can really highlight or lead you to one of the um, answers. Those are great tips. One of the things that I've, I've also tried is um, sometimes I'll skip ahead to the last sentence of the stem. What is the most appropriate initial management strategy? Sometimes they ask for what's the diagnostic study, what's the uh, next step in management, um, you know, so forth and so on. So it kind of helps me to clue in when I'm reading the stems, what they're actually kind of getting. Uh, but let's see. Okay. Good. So it looks like we have some mixed answers here. So um, the key in triaging fluid collections after liver surgery, typically you start with an ultrasound and then percutaneous aspiration or drainage to confirm that you have a biloma. Sometimes that's the definitive, definitive management or it's at least the initial management. So this patient presumed based by the white blood cell count and the elevated bilirubin has an infected biloma. Um, again, that can be diagnosed and typically treated with percutaneous drainage and antibiotics. Um, and typically after this type of liver surgery, it's usually a bile leak from a cut surface ductule or it could be a right bile duct stump leak. Uh, interventions like ERCP and re-exploration are more invasive management strategies and are not indicated unless the biloma fails to resolve with percutaneous drainage. Um, a PTC can, should be avoided because it increases the risk of injury to the remnant liver. Great. A 40-year-old woman undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer presents with fever, rigors, and dyspnea. Her temperature is 38.7 degrees centigrade. White blood cell count is 18,000. Her heart rate is 140 beats per minute. And her initial blood pressure is 80 over 40. She is in respiratory distress and requiring 15 liters of oxygen by face mask. Her cultures are pending. She has a chest radiography that demonstrates right lower lobe infiltrate. She is intubated in the emergency department and is given 30 cc's per kilogram of a crystalloid fluid bolus. Broad spectrum antibiotics are initiated. Despite ongoing fluid resuscitation, her blood pressure remains 80 over 40. What is your next step in management? A, pack red blood cell transfusion to maintain hemoglobin level above 10. B, initiation of therapy with sodium bicarb to normalize her pH. C, initiation of norepinephrine infusion. D, initiate vasopressin infusion. Or E, initiate dobutamine infusion.
Okay. So the answer is C, initiate norepinephrine infusion. So this patient has um, kind of refractory hypertension. So vaso vasopressor therapy is recommended for refractory hypertension after initiation of appropriate fluid resuscitation. The initial vasopressor of choice is norepinephrine because the patient is likely in septic shock. Vasopressin or epinephrine can be added to norepinephrine if needed to raise um, your MAP. Low-dose dopamine for renal protection is no longer recommended. Lobutamine is suggested for patients with evidence of persistent hypoperfusion despite adequate fluid loading in vasopressor agents. Red blood cell transfusion is only recommended for a hemoglobin less than seven unless there are extenuating circumstances such as myocardial ischemia, severe hypoxemia, or acute hemorrhage. The use of sodium bicarb therapy is not recommended unless the patient's pH is abnormal, which they didn't give you in the question stem. Next question. Next question. A 71-year-old man with type 2 diabetes and coronary artery disease with a drug-eluting stent in the left anterior descending coronary artery placed one year ago undergoes an uncomplicated ventral hernia repair with component release. On postoperative day number one, he complains of nausea and mid-back pain, and he is diaphoretic. Telemetry reveals a brief episode of non-sustained VTAC. His heart rate is 115 beats per minute and his blood pressure is 82 over 52. Abdominal examination is unremarkable and his strains have minimal serosanguinous output. EKG reveals no ST or T wave changes, but does show PVCs. What is the next step in management? A, administer a one liter bolus of LR. B, administer an IV fluid bolus and call the cardiologist on call. C, administer an IV fluid bolus Give full dose aspirin and start a heparin drip. Call the cardiologist on call. D, administer an IV fluid bolus and check the troponin level and BMP. Or E, take no further steps if the troponin level is within normal limits. Okay. Did we close the poll or? Yeah, we're going to pull oh, up okay. there. So um, I struggled with this question too. I don't know that I totally agree with the answer. Um, as most people know, ventral hernia repair with component separation is a pretty big surgery. So I don't know too many surgeons that are going to start full dose aspirin and a heparin drip after cutting those muscles. Um, but the kind of rationality or for um, answer C is that the patient is at high risk for acute coronary syndrome and is most likely experiencing symptoms of an MI. So you just have to remember that patients who are in the postoperative period, um, especially if they're older men or if they're females can have atypical presentations of an MI. And in the question stem, they are kind of telling you that he has significant coronary artery disease and already has a stent in place. Um, but I totally think it's reasonable to check a BMP in someone who has PVCs and did have an episode of VTAC as well. A 36-year-old man involved in a motor vehicle crash is brought to the emergency department with hypotension and bradycardia. He is unable to move his lower extremities, but he is able to shrug his shoulders. What is your initial treatment for his hypotension? A, norepinephrine, B, dopamine, C, epinephrine, D, crystalloid fluid bolus, or E, vasopressin? Good. So the answer is D, a crystalloid fluid bolus. The best way to answer this question is to remember that you're dealing with a trauma patient 
So they are kind of leading you toward neurogenic shock, but remember for any patient who comes into the trauma bay in some sort of shock, you always start with fluid resuscitation unless you have a high suspicion for bleeding and then you give blood. Um, the kind of best line of treatment for someone who does have diagnosed neurogenic shock is phenylephrine and that's not an answer um, on this question set. An 18 year old young woman with a history of peanut allergy is brought to the emergency department after accidentally eating a chocolate bar containing peanuts. Her presentation consists of urticaria, diffuse itching, facial swelling, and inspiratory strider. What is the correct dose of intramuscular epinephrine that must be given to this patient immediately? A, 0.5 milligrams, B, one milligram, C, 0.3 milligrams, D, five micrograms per minute infusion, or E, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Looks like we have lots of uh, answers across the board. So this is just um, memorization. So the IM dose of epinephrine is 0.3 milligrams, which is a one in 1000 concentration. The uh, answer A is the IV dose for someone who's having anaphylaxis. A dose of one milligram is for patients who are in cardiac arrest. Um, the Answer D, the infusion is for someone who has refractory hypotension. Um, and E is the dose for pediatric cardiac arrest. A 40 year old woman has sustained a crush injury to both lower extremities. You notice peak T waves on telemetry monitoring. His potassium level is 6.8. What should be your next step? A, myocardial membrane stabilization, B, pushing potassium intracellularly, C, excretion of potassium, D, a 12 lead EKG, or E, obtaining a serum magnesium level. Good. So the answer is A, myocardial membrane stabilization. So that's always your first step, although most of these interventions that are described are kind of happening simultaneously. So you want to give calcium to stabilize the membrane. Um, remember in this question stem, he sustained a crush injury. So they're kind of leading you towards the treatment of hyperkalemia. You can do that with either calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. A 54-year-old woman is in the surgical intensive care unit following an exploratory laparotomy and sigmoid resection for a perforated diverticulum and intra-abdominal sepsis. She remains intubated and sedated on postoperative day two. Since the surgery, her urine output has been slowly decreasing and peak airway pressures have been increasing. The attending surgeon is concerned about abdominal component syndrome. Following complete Paralysis of the patient, a bladder pressure monitor is connected to her Foley catheter, and the intra-abdominal pressure is measured at 32 millimeters of mercury. What is the next best step? A, decompressive laparotomy and temporary abdominal closure. B, decompressive laparotomy and immediate fascial closure. C, aggressive diuresis, or D, continued supportive care. Good. So the answer is A, this patient has abdominal compartment syndrome. You want to release um, that increased intra-abdominal pressure. And if you immediately close the fascia, they are at increased risk of 
redeveloping abdominal compartment syndrome. So the best way to treat that is with temporary abdominal closure. A 30 year old man presents to the emergency department after being struck by a motor vehicle. He was found pinned under the vehicle and required 30 minutes of extrication. On arrival, his blood pressure is 76 over 50, pulse is 132, and he is slow to respond to stimuli. A massive transfusion protocol is initiated. The FAST scan is positive. On expiration, he has a large zone one retroperitoneal hematoma, a large volume of free intraperitoneal blood, several small bowel lacerations, and a grade three liver laceration. After packing the four quadrants, exploration of the hematoma demonstrates complete transection of the vena cava below the renal veins. The patient remains hemodynamically unstable despite transfusion. What is your next step in the management of this vena cava injury? A, perform a right medial visceral rotation, apply clamps proximally and distally to the cava and repair the injury primarily. B, insert a balloon through the laceration, occlude proximally, and transfuse intraoperatively until the patient becomes stable and attempt repair. C, perform a left medial visceral rotation and attempt primary repair with autotransfusing the intraperitoneal blood. D, perform a left medial visceral rotation and pack the injury. Or E, perform a right medial visceral rotation and ligate the vena cava. So the answer is E, perform a right medial visceral rotation and ligate the vena cava. In the setting of an unstable patient with complete transection of the vena cava, the best option is ligation. Um, they're also giving you in the question said that the injury is below the renal veins. Um, and so ligation of the vena cava is safer if you're below the renal veins. Um, and then remember your... Um, medial visceral rotations. So a right medial visceral rotation is a Cattell brash maneuver and a left medial visceral rotation um, is called the Maddox removal. So the left medial visceral rotation is performed for aortic exposure and the right medial visceral rotation is required to expose the vena cava. And I think we have a picture of that. We actually have it uh, coming up for a subsequent question. Oh, okay. You are managing a 91-year-old woman who is currently in the hospital after falling down a flight of stairs. She has a GCS score of 3T and an unstable pelvic fracture that required multiple transfusions and angioembolization. Given her injury burden, what is an essential component in the management of this patient? A, early tracheostomy. B, discussion of goals of care. C, continued aggressive resuscitation and transfusion. Or D, discontinuation of life-sustaining measures. The answer is B, discussion of goals of care. So this patient has a pretty high injury severity score and early discussions um, of goals of care in any trauma patient, especially in elderly patients is important. A 31 year old male construction worker experiences a five centimeter laceration to the lateral aspect of his right forearm. The radial pulse is absent. His right hand does not appear modeled or cyanotic, and he reports feeling pain only at the laceration site. There is minimal bleeding. A CT angiogram demonstrates occlusion of the right radial artery at the mid forearm with a patent ulnar artery and palmar arch. What is the next best step in management? A, ligation. B, debridement of the arterial edges with primary repair. C, interposition grafting using the contralateral basilic vein. D, interposition grafting using the saphenous vein or E, wound care and observation.
So this question's a little tricky because it's probably a combination of A and E. So remember that your dominant um, blood flow to your hand is the ulnar artery, and this patient has an intact ulnar arch. So you can probably take the radial artery, um, which most people would do by ligating it and then performing local wound care. A 30-year-old man is stabbed in the right upper quadrant. In the emergency department, his blood pressure is 80 over 60, and he is diaphoretic and agitated. He is taken immediately to the operating room for exploratory laparotomy. Upon opening the abdomen, two liters of blood are evacuated from the abdominal cavity. After packing, you find a hepatic flexure colon injury, bile in the area of the duodenum, and a large non-expanding right retroperitoneal hematoma below the liver. What is the best course of action? A, pack the abdomen and ev evaluate for stent placement with the celiac axis arteriogram. B, repair the colon and duodenum and place closed suction drains over the retroperitoneal hematoma. C, perform right medial visceral rotation and explore the hematoma. Or D, perform left medial visceral rotation and explore the hematoma. The answer is C, perform right medial visceral rotation, which is known as the Catal brush maneuver, and explore the hematoma. So this patient was stabbed in the right upper quadrant with injury to the colon and the duodenum. Just posterior to these structures lies the IVC and the right renal pedicle um, in the retroperitoneum. A large penetrating hematoma needs to be explored as the hematoma suggests a significant vascular injury, particularly in the setting of massive hemoperitoneum. This area is best approached by right medial visceral rotation where the right colon is mobilized medially and superiorly and the duodenum is cauterized. This maneuver exposes both the right kidney, its vasculature and the IVC. If IVC injury is suspected, proximal and distal control should be obtained before opening the hematoma. If this is not possible, the hematoma can be entered directly and sponge sticks used to compress the the cava while the injury is repaired or the IVC is ligated. So um, this is the picture that we were talking about earlier. So the Catal brush is a right medial to visceral rotation um, and it's best for exposure of the IVC. A Maddox maneuver is a left medial visceral rotation and it's used to expose the aorta. A 40-year-old female pedestrian is brought emergently to the operating room after being struck by an automobile. You perform a lengthy operation requiring left internal iliac artery and vein ligation, splenectomy, a small bowel resection for a complex mesenteric injury. The patient has received 12 units of PRBCs as well as other blood components. Her current core temperature is 35 degrees centigrade with a base deficit of eight. How should she be managed at this time? A, close the abdomen with running suture. B, close the abdomen with interrupted sutures. C, place a temporary abdominal dressing. D, perform component separation to help obtain midline fascial closure with redundancy. Or E, place a bridging biologic mesh. Good, so the answer is C, place a temporary abdominal dressing. Um, so this patient is kind of the best candidate for a damage control operation. So they receive a significant amount of resuscitation. They're cold and they have a base deficit. So they need to be resuscitated, which can increase your risk of kind of developing um, increased intra-abdominal pressures. Um, and because of the mesenteric injury, you wanna be able to eventually evaluate the bowel at a second look um, laparotomy.
A woman sustained deep frostbite to the toes of her left foot while snowmobiling two weeks ago. She underwent appropriate initial management and was referred to your care for amputation of toes two to four. These toes have characteristic thick black eschar over the affected areas, but no evidence of infection. Which of the following will inform your conversation with her about operative management? A, complete demarcation of the tissue involved from frostbite may require weeks to months, so surgery should be deferred. B, early operative management is optimal for patients who sustain severe frostbite to appendages, so she should be scheduled for surgery urgently. C, she should undergo hyperbaric therapy to recover the lost tissue. D, she should receive thrombolytic therapy now in order to salvage the involved toes. Or E, she should be scheduled for sympathectomy urgently. The answer is A, complete demarcation of the tissue involvement from frostbite may require weeks to months, so surgery should be deferred. Amputation decisions should be based on clinical findings, which are often not definitive for months following frostbite injury. Only about 10% of patients with frostbite ultimately require amputation, and the largest contributor to poor outcomes following frostbite is premature surgical intervention. Limited data may show a benefit for hyperbaric therapy in frostbite. These represent small case series and do not serve as a primary indication for hyperbaric treatment. Thrombolytic therapy has been shown to be effective only when used during the first 24 hours following thaw of injury. All right, and our last question. A 33-year-old woman with a history of ulcerative colitis and who is currently on budesonide presents for excision of a cyst on her upper back. The operation is uncomplicated and she is discharged home. At her one week follow-up visit, you inspect the incision site. The wound edges do not approximate. There is minimal granulation tissue. There is no purulence or exudate. What will you prescribe to aid this patient's wound healing? A, zinc, B, calcium, C, vitamin C, D, vitamin A. The answer is D, vitamin A. So um, they are leading you to um, helping to compensate for the effects of chronic steroid use on um, wound healing. These questions are high yield for the ab site. Um, and there is a section in your Pfizer book that kind of goes over all of these, but it's vitamin A. Dr. Haskins, uh, thank you so much for this uh, excellent review. Really appreciated your expertise in walking us through these. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next section, which is on uh, breast and endocrine disease. And for that, we're uh, really excited to have Dr. Amy Rosenbluth from uh, uh, Stony Brook Medicine. Uh, Dr. Rosenbluth, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of this. We're going to continue to move along at a good clip here, and I'll uh, go ahead and bring up the uh, first question. Um, and Dr. Haskins, there's a question in the Q&A. If you have a moment, uh, you can take a look and see if you can answer that. All right, Dr. Rosenbluth, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, I'll get started with the first question. So a 37 year old woman undergoes her first annual screening mammogram. A 0.7 well circumscribed mass consistent with a simple cyst is seen in the left breast. What is the breast imaging reporting and data systems, which is BIRADS classification and what is the next best step in management? Is this a BIRADS zero, an inconclusive study with mammograms suggesting benign findings? A one with a negative mammogram because a simple cyst is a benign finding? A1 because it's a benign finding with another mammogram at six months recommended. A three, probably a benign finding with another mammogram at six months recommended. Or a four, a suspicious finding with a percutaneous biopsy being warranted. 
And while you guys are answering, I just want to reiterate that something like this, like BIRADS or other classification scales are really, really testable materials because it's very easy for test takers to make a multiple choice and offer each classification. So for things like this, it's really important to know the criteria. That way this can be an easy thing for you to get correct. So the answer is actually A. Um, because this needs more um, imaging. So it is a cyst, um, but cysts are best evaluated on ultrasound rather than mammogram. It's an initial screening, so it requires another follow-up, which is why it's a zero. Um, a BIRADS-1 is actually a normal mammogram with no findings. So for B, that's technically incorrect because there is a finding of a cyst, so it can't be a one. Option C is listed as a BIRADS-1, but is actually more of a description of two. Um, option D, a BIRADS-3 um, is, is a short-term follow-up, but a cyst would not be um, considered a BIRADS-3 and BIRADS-4, obviously this isn't suspicious. Five is a highly suggestive of malignancy and six is a known malignancy. So again, the reason it's A is that you need the ultrasound, which is the best way to evaluate a cyst. Um, and it can't be a BIRADS-1 because it's not a completely negative screening. Dr. Rosen, no do you see the second yes. question? Yes, I've yeah. got it up now. Okay. Um, a 47-year-old woman with average breast cancer risk presents with a self-palpated breast mass. She's up to date on screening mammograms, and her last mammogram 10 months ago was normal. She denies any pain, nipple discharge, skin changes, or axillary adenopathy. On exam, there's a one-centimeter mass just adjacent to the nipple areolar complex. A diagnostic mammogram is ordered and negative. What is your next step? Is it an annual screening? an FNA or a coronal biopsy, an ultrasound, an MRI, or an excisional biopsy. Good, so the answer is C, um, but I see there was a little bit of, of confusion with B and D. So A is incorrect because you need to rule out, so you can't just do an annual screening. B, I would say that for breast in general, you would try to avoid FNAs and do core needle biopsies. So this is one of those test taking questions where if you see FNA, you can think it's probably not that. Um, if it's not present on mammogram, but it is a palpable mass, then you wanna move on to an ultrasound screening. Um, which is this part of a standard diagnostic workup. Um, the MRI is a step ahead of ultrasound, so you would definitely do ultrasound before you would consider an MRI for screening, unless there was some other indication for that. And again, you want to evaluate something before you surgically excise it. So that is the reason that it is not E. Moving on to question three. A 62-year-old postmenopausal woman presents with complaints of bloody nipple discharge. She has no history of trauma. Breast examination reveals a uniductal discharge from her right breast. No other abnormalities or masses are noted in either breast. Imaging studies that included an ultrasound and mammogram were negative for any pathology. The next step in her management should be Nipple biopsy, ductal lavage and cytology, repeat imaging in six months, right breast terminal duct excision or reassurance and clinical follow-up. Good, so the answer is D. A couple of people put B. Um, so ductal lavage and cytology um, frequently can show um, kind of a false negative. So that wouldn't be the best thing to go with. Additionally, it's really difficult to complete and to get a good sample on. Um, in a patient who has single duct discharge and bloody, that is a concerning finding. 
Um, so repeat imaging and reassurance would be incorrect. And you really wanna make sure that you get a good sample of what's going on. So terminal duct excision is the best answer. Okay, the next question. Um, a 45 year old woman presents with diffuse bilateral breast pain not related to her menstrual cycle. Her mammogram is normal. Examination reveals bilateral diffuse tenderness, but there are no focal findings or masses. What is the best management that you would recommend? Bromocryptine, over-the-counter evening primrose oil, opioids, estrogen replacement, or encouraging weight loss and use of a sports bra. Good, so you guys got it. Um, I don't know why over the counter evening primrose oil, it's like always on there. It's gonna fake you out. It's on the app site every year, um, but it is encouraging weight loss and use of a sports bra. Observational studies say that low fat diet can sometimes reduce breast pain. In general, large breast stretching Cooper's ligament can cause neck and back and shoulder pain as well as the nostalgia. So wearing a sports bra can be helpful for that. Bromocryptine has been used, but it's not FDA approved. I think we all know that we're trying to avoid opioids and that would not be a great option. So the next question, um, a 42 year old woman was diagnosed with a two centimeter biopsy proven invasive right breast cancer. She has no palpable axillary lymph nodes. She has a history of reduction mammoplasty surgery done 14 years prior. Which of the following is best suited to stage this patient's breast cancer? A, an axillary lymph node dissection, B, a sentinel lymph node biopsy with blue dye and radiocolloid, C, ultrasound only since sentinel lymph node would be inaccurate, sentinel lymph node biopsy with blue dye only, and no axillary staging necessary for her clinical scenario. Great, so you guys got it. B is correct. Um, an axillary lymph node dissection is not great for staging. You wanna start with Sentinel. And then this is one of those test taking questions of what is the best thing. So there are two options that say Sentinel lymph node biopsy, but one wants you to use dye and radiocolloid and the other is just dye. The use of dye and radiocolloid increases the sensitivity of finding the Sentinel lymph node. Axillary staging is of course necessary and ultrasound only would be insufficient. Um, this is kind of one of those Z11 study questions, which is always super testable. So I would recommend making sure you guys go over it for the app site. The next question is a 38 year old woman with average breast cancer risk returns to your clinic eight weeks after you aspirated a simple cyst with recurrence ultrasound um, and examination findings are consistent with previous findings and include a well-circumscribed mobile and tender mass that's thin-walled anechoic with a posterior enhancement. Management involves which of the following? Diagnostic mammogram, needle aspiration under ultrasound guidance, needle aspiration with reflex cytology and culture, ultrasound guided uh, core needle biopsy or surgical excisional biopsy. Um, and there's a lot of questions regarding the reduction mammoplasty affecting the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, you would still perform the sentinel lymph node biopsy either way. I think that's just sort of a red herring in the question. Um, you would still use the dye and the colloid. Okay, so the answer for this is, um, needle aspiration under ultrasound guidance. I could not see the percentage, I accidentally clicked out. Um, but in general, you already know it's a cyst, so you don't need to redo a diagnostic mammogram. 
you would not do cytology and culture unless you had a reason to do so being if what you got back was bloody, then you would send for cytology. If what you got pus, if what you got back was pus, then you would send for culture. Um, you do not need to core needle biopsy assist, nor do you need to surgically excise assist. You would just uh, re-aspirate. Okay, the next question. A 42 year old healthy male presents with three month history of unilateral right breast mass. Physical exam reveals a three centimeter firm irregular mass, um, three centimeters from the nipple overlying skin retraction, no palpable lymphadenopathy. The next appropriate step in workup would include mammogram and ultrasound, wide local excision, three month trial of clomiphene or referral to plastic surgery. And again, as just a text, a test taking tip, please remember that this says the next appropriate step. So it's always important to think that way when it's worded that way. Excellent, you guys got it A. You always have to start with your mammogram and ultrasound. Okay, next, a 52-year-old woman presents with a palpable mass. She undergoes diagnostic imaging followed by biopsy, which demonstrates invasive ductal carcinoma. That's nuclear grade two, ERPR positive, HER2 negative. She's clinically lymph node negative, and she's brought to the operating room for a partial mastectomy, mastectomy and sentinel lymph node biopsy. Earlier in the day, she was injected with technetium-99. In the operating room, you do not detect any signal in the axilla using your probe. What is the appropriate next step in management? Do you inject the breast with blue dye um, to assist with mapping, proceed directly to an axillary lymph node dissection, perform a partial mastectomy and repeat the biopsy on a different day with a different batch of technetium? Do you proceed with surgery in the axilla to assess for any palpable lymph nodes, perform the partial mastectomy and follow the patient with axillary ultrasound? Good, you guys got it, A. Um, so again, this is one of those next best step things. So you wanna try the blue dye if your um, radionucleotide scan did not work. Um, you would not proceed directly to an axillary node dissection. First, you would try the dye. Um, you would not try the axillary or the sentinel node on a different date. Um, just feeling the axilla is not, you would try the dye again first. Um, and ultrasound surveillance is not appropriate. You need to try a uh, lymph node biopsy. A 35 year old woman presents to your clinic after having undergone an FNA biopsy of a 0.9 centimeter thyroid nodule identified on ultrasound. The final pathology report classifies this, no this nodule as the Bethesda type three. What intervention would you recommend for this patient? A lobectomy, repeat FNA or lobectomy, total thyroid clinical follow-up or subtotal thyroidectomy. Okay, so this is again, one of those test taking trick questions. Um, most of you got it, it is B, repeat FNA or lobectomy. Um, you just sort of have to go through the answers and while lobectomy is not a wrong answer, the better answer is that you can FNA to see again or do the lobectomy. Um, and then if you wanna to go to the next slide, we can show the Bethesda, um, criteria. This is just like the BIREDs that we talked about earlier. These are really, really easily testable things where they can just throw up the category or throw up a word and ask you what the category is. So if you can take some time to go through those and make sure you know them, it'll be really helpful.
Next question, a 23 year old woman with a history of uh, MEN type 2A had a thyroidectomy three days ago. Her surgeon states that her calcitonin level immediately after the surgery was unchanged from the level before surgery at about 80. What is the next best step? Assurance and follow-up in two to three months, neck ultrasound to assess for residual disease, CT to assess for extra thyroid source of metastasis, intraoperative assessment of the thyroid bed. Uh, yes, so A is correct. The timing um, and measurement of serum calcitonin after surgery is important because the concentration can fall slowly in some patients and it may not reach its nadir for several months. Um, so you wouldn't want to make any decisions based on an immediately post-op calcitonin level. Um, a 25-year-old woman is diagnosed with a 1.5 centimeter papillary thyroid cancer in the left lobe of her thyroid gland. No one in her family has thyroid cancer and she's not been exposed to ionizing radiation. There's no, sus no suspicious nodes in the ultrasound performed in the clinic and the cancer appears to be completely surrounded by normal thyroid tissue with no extra thyroidal extension. She would prefer not to take medication after surgery if possible. The right lobe is completely without nodules. At the time of surgery, visual inspection of the left central neck nodes reveal a two centimeter lymph node just below the sternal notch that's removed and comes back positive for... Um, papillary thyroid cancer on frozen section. What is the most appropriate surgical management? Left thyroid lobectomy, total thyroidectomy, left thyroid lobectomy with left central, left modified radical neck dissection, total thyroidectomy with left central neck lymph node dissection, or total thyroidectomy with left central and left modified radical neck dissection. Good. So D is the answer. Um, obviously, just um, a lobectomy would be insufficient when she's node positive, as would a total thyroid, because you need to do a dissection in the area um, that you had your positive lymph node, but you don't need to do a modified radical neck dissection. So that leaves D as your answer. A 60-year-old woman has a 4.5 centimeter adrenal pheochromocytoma that has been confirmed biochemically. What is the most important next step in preparation for surgery in this patient? Is it a type and screen for blood, administration of an ACE inhibitor, correction of electrolyte abnormalities, administration of an alpha blocker or administration of a beta blocker? Great, you guys got it. Pheochromocytoma alpha blockade. Um, a 30 year old woman is having preoperative consultation before she undergoes a total thyroidectomy. Her free T3 and T4 levels are within normal limits. She's given prescription to take um, Lugol solution for 10 days before the surgery, other than to prevent thyrotoxicos thyrotoxicosis crisis. Why is this treatment prescribed for this patient? Is it A, to decrease intraoperative blood loss, to prevent recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, to reduce the risk for hypoparathyroidism after surgery, to reduce the risk for surgical site infection, or to prevent seroma formation? Yeah, so the answer is A, to decrease intraoperative blood loss. 
Um, Lugols has been shown to decrease the vascularity of the thyroid gland and therefore decrease surgical blood loss. It has no effect on um, finding the recurrent laryngeal nerve, finding the parathyroids. It does not have any effect on surgical site infections or seromas. A 35-year-old woman presents to the emergency department with headaches, hypertension, and a blood pressure of 200 over 120. She's given metoprolol for the hypertension and goes into cardiac failure requiring an intra-aortic balloon pump. Uh, subsequently, she is found to have four centimeter right adrenal mass that's confirmed biochemically to be a pheochromocytoma. What's the most likely explanation for the cardiac failure in this patient? Intracranial bleed from hypertension, inadequate beta blockade, baseline underlying heart failure, failure to use calcium channel blocker initially to control hypertension, or administration of beta blocker before an alpha blocker. Good. Administration of a beta blocker before an alpha blocker. You guys clearly have the alpha blockade on pheochromocytomas down. Unopposed alpha stimulation can exacerbate a hypertensive crisis and lead to cardiac failure. And our last question. A 53-year-old man is found to have a 3.5 centimeter right thyroid nodule. Ultrasound is positive for lateral cervical lymphadenopathy. FNA is consistent with lymphoma. What is the most appropriate management for this patient? Observation, total thyroidectomy with right lateral neck dissection, right lobectomy, or CHOP and radiation. So this is a lymphoma question that is masquerading as an endocrine question. So yes, lymphoma gets CHOP and radiation therapy. No surgery is indicated. All right, Dr. Rosenbluth, that was a terrific review of uh, breast and endocrine disease. Really, really uh, appreciate also your tips for test taking were very helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. All right, so moving on to our next uh, panel. Uh, super excited to have Dr. Sarah Hennessy here with us today from the University of Texas Southwestern. Dr. Hennessy is gonna lead us through a discussion of a variety of topics that uh, always show up in the app site, including transplant, thoracic, pediatrics, and plastics. Uh, Dr. Hennessy, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, We'll get started right away. Um, a 45-year-old man wants to donate a kidney to his brother. During the course of the evaluation, he is determined to be ABO group A. His brother is ABO group O. Which of the following is the best option? Cancel the proposed transplant. Proceed with the transplant without any additional intervention. Enroll the donor and recipient in a kidney paired exchange program. Proceed with the transplant after induction with thymoglobulin. Um, proceed with the transplant after induction with baxaliximab. And while everybody's doing this, I'll echo what Dr. Rosenbluth said, um, is to really look at the stem or the last sentence and what they're asking, which is the best option, even though there could be several different options could be plausible in what they're um, asking. Um, but what they're really asking is for the best one. Okay, perfect. So um, the majority um, of everybody got it right. C, enroll the donor and recipient in a kidney paired exchange program. Um, just quickly, a couple of those are probably not good options, which is canceling the transplant altogether. We don't wanna lose um, that opportunity. And then the last two are, 
um, immunosuppression induction um, medications are used for standard transplantation. So those wouldn't be options either. Um, and then, you know, they do do ABO incompatible um, kidney transplantation, but that requires a lot of um, preparatory, preparatory work in order to get those patients ready. Um, so C is the best answer. Question two, a 57 year old man with a long standing history of alcohol abuse presents to the hepatology clinic for evaluation. He was recently hospitalized for a first episode of large volume hematemesis. On exam, he is cachectic with obvious muscle wasting of his extremities. His abdominal examination notes distension and varicose veins around the umbilical hernia, but he is non-tender. His lab results are notable for creatinine of 2.1, a hemoglobin of 7.6, platelets of 49, what, which factor in this patient's history and physical exam is most linked to his ability to get an offer for a liver transplant? A, varices and upper GI bleeding, B, muscle wasting, C, ascites, D, elevated creatinine, E, low platelets. Perfect. Um, so the answer is D, elevated creatinine. Um, remember the MELD score is used to prioritize which patients um, will receive liver transplants first. Um, and the only one of these answers that's within the MELD score is the creatinine. So remember that's made up of creatinine, um, the bilirubin and the INR. And most recently they've added sodium as a reflection of the vasodilatory status of cirrhotic patients, um, which is um, an independent um, factor in their MELD score. All the other answers um, are yes, sequelae of cirrhosis, um, but not determinants of whether or not they can get a liver transplant. Um, for two hours after a renal transplant, a man's urine output has been 15 milliliters per hour. He has received two liters of crystalloid as boluses and appears volume resuscitated. His blood pressure is 140 over 80. A renal ultrasound shows good perfusion to the kidney with normal waveforms in the arteries and the veins, and there are no signs of bleeding. What should the next step in management be? A, high dose methylprednisolone. B, transfer to the surgical ICU with central line placement and pressors to obtain superphysiologic perfusion. C, continued fluid boluses. D, maintenance fluids with reassurance given to the patient and the staff. And E, immediate hemodialysis. Great, the answer is D, maintenance fluids with reassurance. So um, this question is really getting at delayed graft function um, as a diagnosis and that it should be a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, so any change or drop in urine output after um, a renal transplant needs prompt investigation. Um, you're really getting the ultrasound to look for a vascular thrombosis, any bleeding compartment syndrome, a urinal obstruction or a leak um, or any signs of inadequate perfusion. Once all of those things have been ruled out, um, then for delayed graft function is your presumed diagnosis and um, time is what you need um, and reassurance. Um, there are a couple answers there that are obvious, um, um, obviously incorrect, immediate hemodialysis. There's nothing in the stem that gives you an indication for that. Um, continuing fluid boluses will only volume overload the patient. Um, transferring them to the ICU doesn't make a lot of sense in a hemodynamically stable patient. Um, and giving more um, immunosuppression without a reason um, is not the right answer either. 
an 88 year old woman with an oxygen dependent chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic artery disease and systolic heart failure and poorly controlled diabetes presents with shortness of breath that has worsened over two weeks. A chest X-ray demonstrates a large left pleural fusion and mediastinal widening. CT of the chest shows significant diffuse lymphadenopathy, including bulky mediastinal lymph nodes. Thoracentesis reveals a milky fluid. Pleural studies confirm the presence of chylothorax um, and a chest drainage catheter is placed. After seven days of conservative management, daily outputs are 1300 um, a day. What is the next best step in management of this patient? While you guys are answering this, um, Sometimes when it, the stem is so long, I like to highlight the things that are really key, that you have a chylothorax, you've had seven days of conservative management, and um, how much the daily output is um, to help me narrow down on um, how to best answer the question. Great, so the answer is thoracic duct embolization. Um, for those that picked C, um, thoracic, um, thoracoscopic thoracic duct ligation, you know, I think that is um, a, a possible answer. Um, the only reason that I think that that's not the best answer is given the patient's age and their comorbidities. If instead you had a patient that was 40 and healthy, um, depending on the reason um, why they had a chylothorax, I think that that would be a very reasonable choice. But thoracic duct embolization is a um, less invasive way of um, managing this. And then the other options, which are more chest tubes or continuing the management you're doing is obviously not going to work um, as you've already done it for a week um, without success. Um, a 55-year-old man with end-stage renal disease who is being dialyzed via left internal jugular vein catheter develops facial and bilateral upper extremity swelling. He has not experienced any weight loss, fevers, or night sweats. A CT scan demonstrates a very large azygous vein. How should treatment of this patient proceed? Leave the catheter in place and perform a thrombectomy. Remove the catheter, dialyze using a right internal jugular vein catheter remove the catheter and perform percutaneous transluminal balloon dilation or stent placement. Um, and then lastly, remove the catheter and perform an emergency surgical thrombectomy. I think this is a little bit of a tough question. The answer is C, um, which the majority did get correct. Remove the catheter and perform a percutaneous transluminal balloon dilation or stent placement. Um, what this question is really um, getting at is superior vena cava syndrome um, caused uh, by a stenosis or um, thrombus um, from your uh, catheter in the IJ. Um, the, you know, the um, best um, treatment for this is removing the catheter when you can, meaning you have to have other access um, for dialysis, and then you really want to either do a balloon um, dilation or stent placement presumptively of the um, stenotic area. If that fails, um, then surgical intervention is the next answer. A 19-year-old man presents to the emergency department after a gunshot wound to the chest. A right chest tube is placed with a 500 milliliter output of frank blood. After two days, he continues to have a right basilar opacity on chest x-ray. What is the next best step in management? Per, uh, place a second chest tube, obtain a chest uh, CT, Take the patient for immediate video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, instill intrapleural fibrinolytics via a chest tube, continue current management with a single chest tube.
Um, so the correct answer here is B, obtain a chest uh, CT scan. Um, the other options are possible depending on what you see on CT. So the really important part of this question is what is the next best step? Um, so before you take somebody to the operating room, you're gonna wanna get better imaging. Um, placing a second chest tube may or may not be the right thing depending on what um, you find on imaging. So again, the next best step um, is a CT scan. A 28-year-old man with no significant medical history presents with acute onset of left-sided chest pain and dyspnea. A chest x-ray confirms the presence of a spontaneous pneumothorax, a pleural pigtail catheter is placed, and a small air leak is noted in the attached um, water seal device. After five days of observation, the air leak has not resolved. After confirming catheter and line integrity, what is the appropriate next step in management of this patient? Placement of a second chest tube, video-assisted video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and pleurodesis, removal of the pleural catheter, continued observation with a current pleural catheter, removal of the pleural catheter, and formal tube thoracostomy. Great, so most everybody got this right. B, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and pleurodesis. Um, so, you know, this patient has um, a spontaneous pneumothorax with a prolonged air leak, um, which uh, gets defined as greater than four days. And in these situations, um, the next best appropriate management is going to the operating room. If the patient is a poor surgical candidate or they refuse, then you can use some of the um, um, other options for management of the spontaneous pneumothorax. But if they're a good surgical candidate, the next best step is um, going to the operating room and doing a pleurodesis. A nine month old boy presents with a two centimeter reducible umbilical hernia. The hernia intermittently gets bigger, especially when he is crying, according to the mother. Approximately six months ago, granulation tissue was treated with silver nitrate and topical steroids and it has resolved. What is the most appropriate next step? Elective repair of the umbilical hernia, abdominal ultrasound, no intervention at this point, provide reassurance to the mother, topical silvonitrate, abdominal binder. Great, so C, no intervention at this point, provide reassurance. I think the key part um, to remember in the STEM is that it's a nine month old boy um, and um, there's no indication for repair at this age without risk, without obvious um, incarceration or strangulation. Um, and uh, otherwise, unless you see something on physical exam that would um, indicate that there's no need for imaging um, and none of the other um, D or E makes a lot of sense. So reassurance is the best next step. A neonate born at 34 weeks is diagnosed with necrotizing enterocolitis after having bloody stools, respiratory variations, pneumatosis intestinalis, and erythema of the abdominal wall. The infant undergoes an exploratory laparotomy. There are several areas of patchy necrosis along the intestinal tract with two discrete perforations noted in the distal jejunum and mid ilium. During laparotomy, the infant develops hypotension that does not initially respond to fluid and blood transfusions. What is the next best step? Resect from the distal jejunum to the transverse colon with an end-to-end -end anastomosis. Resect the areas of perforation, leaving the bowel in discontinuity and place the silo. Close the abdomen. Resect the perforated segments and bring out a proximal jejunum. Place a peritoneal drain and close the abdomen.
Um, great, so most everybody got this correct. Resect the areas of perforation, leaving the bowel in discontinuity and place the silo. Um, I think the key is what probably most everybody picked up on is that the patient is hypotensive and not responsive to resuscitation in the operating room. And when this situation um, occurs, you wanna do the um, bare minimum and um, get the patient to uh, the ICU for resuscitation um, and make them stable before you do any sort of definitive um, therapy or treatment. 10, a seven-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department following a bicycle accident. He is pale and tachycardic, and he has a rigid abdomen with a bruise over the right upper quadrant. His parents ask what tests can be performed to make a diagnosis Sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, the, his parents ask what tests can be performed to make a diagnosis while limiting his radiation exposure. You tell the parents that the next diagnostic step is to obtain which of the following? A serum amylase because an elevated value will confirm pancreatic transection, obviating the need for radiation exposure. A CT scan of the abdomen because duodenal hematoma is associated with this injury and the risk of radiation exposure is outweighed by the ability to obtain a diagnosis. A FAST examination because a normal study rules out intra-abdominal injury, obviating the need for radiation exposure. Dedicated spine imaging because a chance fracture is associated with this injury and the risk of radiation exposure is outweighed by the ability to obtain a diagnosis. Emergent angiography to diagnose and treat a potential liver laceration because the risk of radiation exposure is outweighed by the ability to obtain a diagnosis and provide treatment. Great, so the answer is B, <clears throat> a CT scan of the abdomen. Um, and so in these situations um, with a handlebar injury, um, it could cause a variety of different abdominal injuries, including a duodenal hematoma and pancreatic transection. Um, and uh, the presence of any abdominal findings should really prompt evaluation um, for an injury with a CT scan. Although there is a risk of radiation exposure the risk benefit ratio outweighs that. Um, all the other answers um, in terms of imaging um, are not accurate um, because you can't identify the injuries adequately um, with those. Um, and um, although a chance fracture is possible with this type of injury, that's not um, um, what the question is really getting at. An 11 month old child presents to the emergency department with abdominal pain and bilious emesis. The emergency room resident informs you that guaiac positive stool was found during the initial workup. During the history and physical examination, you learn that the patient has had occasional bilious emesis during the past year that has not yet been evaluated. The patient is tachycardic and poorly perfused. The abdomen is tense. How do you proceed? I'm sorry, um, order an upper gastrointestinal contrast study, proceed to the operating room for an exploratory laparotomy, proceed to the operating room for a diagnostic laparoscopy, order a CT scan of the abdomen pelvis with contrast, admit for observation and IV fluid hydration. Um, so the answer is here, um, here is B, proceed to the operating room um, for 
exploratory laparotomy. I can see why some might say order an upper GI contrast study. And um, that would, I think, be correct if this patient didn't present with tachycardia, um, evidence of poor perfusion and a tense abdomen. Um, and uh, you know what they're really um, demonstrating is a clinical picture of um, congenital malrotation with midgut volvulus. And given that the patient is an extremis, going um, for diagnostic studies um, would uh, put the bowel at more jeopardy. And so going directly to the operating room um, is the right answer and doing that in the most expeditious fashion um, is the right answer. Laparoscopy um, is here not the right answer because the patient's abdomen is tense and the patient um, is uh, um, somewhat unstable. A male infant has recently undergone surgery for meconium ileus via an enterotomy and primary closure. He has been receiving NAC irrigations regularly. He is now noted to have bilious emesis and a distended abdomen, and he appears uncomfortable. What is the next step in management? Observation and continued NAC irrigations, re-exploration with resection of previous anastomosis and end colostomy with mucus fistula, re-exploration with manual milking of meconium through previous anastomosis and subsequent abdominal closure, observation alone with cessation of NAC irrigation, re-exploration with resection of previous anastomosis and aggressive degree, um, debridement of meconium stained bowel along with an end colostomy with mucus fistula. So the answer here is B, re-exploration with resection of previous anastomosis and, and colostomy with mucus fistula. Um, really what they're getting at here is that there was failed conservative um, surgery. And so it requires a more definitive um, treatment. Reoperation is likely necessary for recurrent meconium ileus. Um, re-exploration with milking and abdominal closure is unlikely to be successful and will probably lead to another occurrence of meconium ileus. Um, and then really you should avoid any aggressive debridement of meconium stained bowel um, because this can lead to a lot of um, cirrhosal injuries. Um, so the answer is B. While in the process of obtaining a split thickness skin graft for a relatively large wound, you realize that you forgot to check the setting of the dermatome. You notice that your dermatome is set too deep and you are now elevating full thickness skin with underlying fat visible. What is your next step? Take the full thickness skin graft at the same setting and primarily close the donor site. Stop the dermatome, reverse the instrument, suture the elevated full thickness skin flap back down, recheck the depth setting and choose another donor site. Stop the dermatome, reverse the instrument, set the instrument to the correct depth and take a split thickness skin graft overlying the same site. Stop the operation, replace the dressings and reschedule the procedure. Great, um, the answer is B. Um, and remember split thickness skin grafts, um, the goal depth is 0 0.01 to 0 0.014 inches. Um, for a large wound bed, um, full thickness um, grafts are not ideal. Um, and then in this situation, um, you wanna do exactly what's listed is reverse it, um, suture the elevated flat back down and then choose another donor site. A 25-year-old man presents after traumatic injury in which he sustained an irregularly shaped three centimeter loss of the skin and subcutaneous tissue to the lateral aspect of the brow. When the surgeon is considering using a skin graft for revision, what is the primary concern given the anatomic location of the lesion? The extent of mesh fenestration for split thickness skin graft, 
minimizing the donor site size when harvesting the graft, the cosmetic appearance of a full thickness and split thickness grafts, the extent of primary graft contraction at the time of harvest. Great, um, so the answer is C, the cosmetic appearance. Um, the, um, remember a mesh um, split thickness skin graft generally heals with that like alligator skin or that pebble stone appearance, um, whereas a full thickness graft or unmeshed um, split thickness skin grafts don't. And given the location, it's more optimal um, for cosmetic um, um, appearance for it to be a full thickness um, skin graft. And then the last question, a 72 year old woman is struck by a car. She's immediately brought to the emergency department with an isolated right lower extremity fracture with significant soft tissue injury. She's hemodynamically stable. Uh, neurovascular exam reveals intact motor and sensation, but absent pulses. X-rays demonstrate a severely comminuted tib um, tibia and fibula fracture without bone loss. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this injury? A, amputation of the unsalvageable extremity, B, angi angiography or CTA of the extremity, C, surgical exploration and revascularization, D, closed fracture reduction and splinting, E, fasciotomies. So um, the right answer is actually D, um, closed reduction and splinting. Um, and I see there is a mixed um, kind of answer. This is the most appropriate first maneuver. Um, so you should reduce the fracture and then repeat the pulse exam um, after the reduction. Um, because once you reduce the fracture, you may actually have return of pulses. And if this happens, then you don't really need to um, uh, move forward um, necessarily with um, any sort of imaging or intervention. Now, but if it gets reduced and the pulses are still not present, um, then the next probably appropriate step is imaging. Um, the, um, I think most people had picked B um, first, I can't remember, um, but that's the difference between B and D. So the most appropriate answer is reduce it first then redo your pulse exam and then determine if you need um, imaging at that point or not. Dr. Hennessy, uh, that was a terrific overview of a variety of topics. Um, thank you so much for guiding us through that and your excellent, excellent explanations. Really, really appreciate it. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. All right, and for our final panel in uh, part two of our AppSite webinar, we're uh, extremely fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jerry Fortuna. Uh, Dr. Fortuna is a uh, uh, vascular and uh, critical care uh, trauma surgeon here at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Dr. Fortuna, welcome and thank you so much for being a part of this today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Yeah, I guess it's good since you guys have been so excited to get vascular right at the end and then you were putting me in about 10 questions early, so everybody <laughs> must be supercharged. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll get rocking and rolling here. Um, so first question, a uh, 65 year old man is in the ICU after undergoing emergency repair of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. He requires presser support and is on the ventilator. His urine output is scant. His potassium level is 5.6 and his creatinine level is six. His EKG shows peak P waves. What is the most appropriate next step in obtaining dialysis access for this patient? A, short-term dialysis catheter placed in the internal jugular vein at the bedside. B, short-term dialysis catheter placed in the subclavian vein at the bedside. Long, uh, C, long-term dialysis catheter placed in the internal jugular vein with fluoroscopy. 
D, long-term dialysis catheter placed in the subclavian vein with fluoroscopy, or E, long-term dialysis catheter placed in the femoral vein with fluoroscopy. Okay, good. And so it looks like um, everybody, for the most part, got this correct. Um, really, the most expeditious and safest way to get this patient emergent dialysis access would be through uh, a short-term dialysis catheter placed in the IJ at the bedside. Um, the subclavian vein is less optimal, one, um, because there's increased potential complications with the actual access through the stick. It's a larger bore catheter and it's difficult um, if you have a, uh, a bad stick in that location to provide any sort of compression. And uh, certainly if you were just an expert using ultrasound and had a perfectly placed thing, there's still the long-term complication of developing uh, central stenosis in this location. The other answers are not right because you don't in an emergent setting want to take people for a, a fluoroscopy uh, where you've got to move the patient to put a long-term dialysis catheter in. This is emergent, so you want to do what's quick and expeditious. Okay. Next question. Um, a 70-year-old woman is being transferred to your hospital with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. You discuss with anesthesia and the operating room staff how to most safely and expeditiously treat her. You decide to do which of the following. A, immediately induce general anesthesia to facilitate patient exposure and secure the airway. B, administer blood product and crystalloid to maintain blood pressure in the normal range until setup is complete. C, have extra staff available to assist in quickly turning the patient for a retroperitoneal approach. D, prep the patient's skin after induction of anesthesia to avoid patient hypothermia prior to incision. E, have at least three aortic excluding balloons available so that aortic control can be established percutaneously. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a mixed bag on this one. Um, the correct answer is uh, E. So we'll run through this real quick since we were kind of all over the map. Um, <clears throat> so question A, we had a, a fair amount of folks. You don't want to immediately induce someone who's already hypotensive and not doing well. Um, that can uh, generate um, cardiovascular collapse and the patient would probably die right in front of you. So you've got to find a way to stabilize their blood pressure uh, and that eliminates that as an option. Um, the, uh, most people put B, what's wrong here is you don't want, this is a whole idea of permissive uh, hypotension, just like in a trauma patient. So you don't want to raise your blood pressure um, high to induce additional bleeding. So we're really looking at the option in these stems of how we can get um, blood pressure or um, uh, hemorrhagic control as quick as possible. Um, it doesn't help to have extra staff, you know, moving the patient around and, and you, you're certainly not going to do a retroperitoneal approach uh, to try to get a clamp on. There are quicker ways to get clamps, whether that be through a thoracotomy, um, whether it be through a laparotomy with superciliac control, which is manual pressure, um, or the obvious answers we'll get to, which is um, you know, quick percutaneous access with the balloon. And then um, uh, D was, would not be correct um, because we don't want to prep um, after induction. We would want to do it before in case they did collapse if you were going to go down that route to try to um, uh, induce the patient if your blood pressure was better than what they were saying here. It's a little weird on the final answer and saying having three aortic balloons. Um, you need aortic balloons. I would say at a minimum, you need two. Uh, because once you get your superciliac and you put your sheath up to keep the balloon from migrating, you can get your device in and you're going to put your second balloon up through the uh, contralateral gate so that you can remove the other balloon to be able to work through it. Um, anyway, in the uh, kind of endovascular era and with the stems that they gave you, um, 
that's the most appropriate um, response. Question three, a 55 year old male underwent a partial colectomy for diverticulitis on post-operative day one. He is found unresponsive and is intubated. After multiple attempts, a right femoral vein catheter is placed. A large hematoma to site is seen on the following day without skin necrosis. Distal pulses are palpable. Color flow duplex ultrasound demonstrates a 1.6 centimeter pseudoaneurysm. What is the next step in management? A, observation and repeat ultrasound in four weeks. B, resection of the pseudoaneurysm and interposition graft. C, endovascular covered stent. D, ultrasound guided thrombin injection or E, ultrasound guided compression. Okay, again, kind of a mixed bag, so we'll run through. Looks like the most uh, common choice picked was D, which is ultrasound guided thrombin injection. <clears throat> I have to admit, I have a tiny bit of a problem with this question as well, because I think that's a reasonable option. I think what they're really wanting to hammer home as the take home point in this stem is that there is a criteria for intervention on uh, pseudoaneurysms and that size criteria is greater than two centimeters. And that's what kind of makes uh, the rest of the answers um, uh, in the uh, choices incorrect. So because this is less than two centimeters, uh, the, really the right thing book answer is to watch this, repeat it, um, and see if there is a uh, progression. If there's progression greater than two centimeters, then it's treated with ultrasound guided thrombin injection. Uh, and because of that, the other answers are, are incorrect. So this is just kind of a, uh, uh, knowing the threshold kind of deal. And I'm sure that in a lot of people's institutions, this would be treated with uh, thrombin injection um, to try to get the patient out of the hospital and, and make them more comfortable. The only other thing I would say about these is just, uh, if they give you questions about pseudoaneurysms, remember that the size of the neck is also very important. If you have wide-based short necks, those don't get injected. They have to be repaired. If they're narrow-based necks that are long, necks that are long, those are more amenable and will be more successful. And the reason for that is, is you have to worry about embolization of the thrombin as you're injecting it into the pseudoaneurysm. So hopefully that helps uh, clear things up there. Next question. A 46-year-old woman with end-stage renal disease presents to the emergency department. Uh, from dialysis with a thrombose left prosthetic brachial and a cubital forearm looped AV access graft. Per her chart, the prosthetic AV access was placed one year ago and was working well until dialysis earlier today. On physical exam, her left arm, of her left arm, she has no thrill or bruit in the access and no edema, and she has a palpable radial, radial ulnar and brachial pulses. What is the most likely cause of the AV access thrombosis in this patient? A poor arterial inflow, B, stenosis of the graft arterial anastomosis, C, intraprosthetic graft stenosis, D, stenosis of the graft venous anastomosis, or E, central venous stenosis. Great, and most folks here got the right answer of stenosis of the, of the graft venous anastomosis. And this is just a, a knowing <coughs> that given that the graft has been in for a year, that's considered a late access complication and the most common cause of late um, graft access complications are through neo-intimal hyperplasia that forms at the venous anastomosis between the vein and the plastic. Okay, next question. During attempted placement of a right internal jugular temporary dialysis catheter, a 55-year-old man becomes agitated and moves during the needle stick. 
The procedure is temporarily halted and he is sedated. Placement is reattempted and the dialysis catheter is placed without incident. However, five minutes later, he becomes short of breath with a blood pressure of 83 over 45 and a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. What is the likely diagnosis of the next best step? A, pneumothorax, confirmed with a chest radiograph in place the right-sided chest tube. B, pneumothorax, needle decompress the right chest and place the right-sided chest tube. C, hemothorax, start a bolus of normal saline, place the right-sided chest tube and order packed red blood cells. D, air embolus, place the patient in the Trudelenburg position with the left side down. <clears throat> All right, we're getting back on the train here. So the correct answer is B. Um, this is correct because the patient is showing signs of hemodynamic instability and the most likely uh, diagnosis here is with a uh, pneumothorax. So you wanna be able to needle decompress that and get your chest tube in. And that's kind of standard ATLS protocol. Um, some people put D, air embolus. Um, this is not how a patient would um, likely respond um, secondary to an air embolus um, as the mo most likely diagnosis is gonna be the pneumothorax with the patient. Um, um, moving during the procedure. Okay. Next question. Two months after placement of a brachial stock fistula for dialysis, a 67-year-old female is complaining of pain in the hand below the fistula that worsens on dialysis. The dialysis unit uh, does not feel that they can lower her flow rates as they are barely obtaining adequate dialysis. On exam, she has a cool hand with a radial signal detectable only by Doppler. Upon manual occlusion in the fistula, the hand becomes warm and the radial pulse becomes palpable. Angiography shows the fistula to be patent with inflow or out, without inflow or outflow obstruction. The best uh, next management choice is A, reassurance and reduction of dialysis flow. B, brachial brachial bypass with distal brachial ligation. C, distal revascularization and interval ligation, D, banding, narrowing of the anastomosis of the fistula, or E, ligation of the fistula. Dr. Fortuna, we have a diagram to go along with this question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, looks like we're split between C and D. So um, the reason that D is not correct um, in this question is that they're giving you in the stem that the patient is already having issues with low flow rates during the dialysis. And so the concern here is, is that if you band it which if they had not put that in there, I would say is the appropriate response because you don't want to alter the patient's native arterial flows uh, unless you have to. Um, but because the flow rates, rates are low, by banning it, you could um, further generate low flow states within the fistula that may cause thrombosis. Um, so the best answer in this is to do a drill, which you see here, which is you perform a bypass proximal to the anastomosis to distal so that you promote, um, you're basically increasing the resistance through the fistula so that you promote a lower resistant tube to provide better perfusion down to the hand. Um, and you have to do that by ligating distal to the fistula so you don't sacrifice the fistula. Hopefully that makes sense and um, you know, um, explains why banding would not be the first choice in that particular stem. Okay. Next question. An 85-year-old man presents to the emergency department with diffuse abdominal pain and bloody stools. 
CT angiography reveals a patent celiac and inferior mesenteric arteries, but an occluded superior mesenteric artery immediately distal to the middle colic branch. He is taken emergently to the operating room and on entry to the abdomen, his bowel from the ligament atrites to the splint flexure is frankly necrotic. What is the next best step in management? A, bowel resection, B, abdominal closure and palliation, C, superior mesenteric artery embolectomy, D, retrograde mesenteric bypass to the celiac and superior mesenteric arteries, or E, anagrade mesenteric bypass to the SMA alone. Okay, B. So it looks like most folks got this right. Um, so I, I think I can make this short. This is just kind of a key tenet in emergency general surgery when dealing with mesenteric ischemia, and that's that step one is always assessment of the bowel if you're going to the operating room. And the reason is, is for this particular scenario, if you have a non uh, survivable situation where you have complete necrosis of the entire bowel, there's no role for any sort of revascularization. So it's always this assessment of the bowel, remove um, dead necrotic material. If you have a survivable situation, then you can proceed with any number of different revascularization techniques that they don't um, really allow you then to discern from in this stem. So the key is that this is not survivable. And so you would close and then it would be palliative. You may see different variations of that, um, but uh, whether that be on a written or an oral board, but that's the kind of the way to approach it. Um, next question, a uh, 56 year old man with chronic uh, rate controlled atrial fibrillation stopped his Coumadin prior to a colonoscopy one week ago. He is otherwise healthy and takes no other medications. He presents with pain in his left calf after walking two miles in 90 degree temperatures. He has absent pulses of his popliteal anterior tibial and dors uh, uh, dorsalis pedis arteries in that leg. Uh, this is accompanied by pallor and pain. What is the most likely etiology? A, embolus as a result of his atrial fibrillation. B, embolus that originated from an aortic plaque. C, paradoxical embolus. D, thrombosis from hypotension. E, thrombosis from hypercoagulability. All right, great. You guys kind of gobbled this up. Uh, the correct answer is embolus as a result of his atrial fibrillation. Um, there are really two main causes. These are uh, embolism and thrombosis. 80% of cases are from uh, emboli. The most likely source from this stem, from him recently stopping his anticoagulation is from his AFib. Certainly you would look at uh, working him up postoperatively for any sort of aortic pathology. Um, after you were able to get his um, flow restored and uh, had him on anticoagulation. Um, it's unlikely um, given the stem and the scenario and the patient's age um, and lack of uh, pre-diagnosis uh, of peripheral arterial disease that this is from a clot that, um, or a, uh, a lesion that thrombosed and developed clot due to a low flow state or rupture of plaque. Okay, next question. 70 year old man with a history of one block right leg claudication presents with six hours of pain and tingling in his right foot. He has mild sensory loss and normal motor function. Femoral pulse is present, but distal pulses are absent. Pedal Doppler signals are faint, but present. How will you manage this patient? A, best medical therapy, aspirin, statin, and wrist factor modification. B, hospitalization with anticoagulation and a bridge to Coumadin. C, hospitalization with anticoagulation and angiography. D, fempop artery bypass, or E, an aortobifem bypass. Great. 
great. So most people got this here. Um, so really this is another kind of the, you know, just a category and classification that you need to know when dealing with uh, vascular um, issues. This is acute uh, limb ischemia and it goes by Rutherford classification. Uh, it's easily testable and you should review this. This patient, because he has sensory changes, is a Rutherford 2A. And so therefore you have an opportunity to bring him in and anticoagulate him and then proceed with an angiogram to see what kind of intervention you can do from that standpoint to restore his inline flow. <coughs> this gives you the best options to be able to either perform thrombolysis or direct mechanical thrombectomy to restore the flow. And then certainly if you weren't able to do this, then your bypasses uh, would come into play uh, depending on your anatomy and what you were able to reestablish. You certainly wouldn't want to sit on this patient uh, with just best medical therapy is that they are already showing uh, signs of acute um, critical limb ischemia. So he needs an intervention um, urgently, but not emergently. If there was motor function, uh, that would put it in an emergent nature. <clears throat> and he would be a rather for 2B. Okay, next question. Um, a 68-year-old man undergoes repair of an abdominal aortic aneurysm complicated by hemorrhage and prolonged aortic cross clamping below the renal arteries. 12 hours postoperatively, he develops frequent premature ventricular contractions and arterial blood glass analysis is normal. Electrocardiography shows a widened QRS complex and peak T waves. The most appropriate initial management is the infusion of A, normal saline, one liter by IV bolus over 15 minutes. B, Lasix, 40 milligrams IV. C, calcium chloride, 10 mLs of 5% solution. D, sodium bicarbonate, 45 milli equivalents by IV bolus or E, insulin, two units per hour intravenously. Very good. So almost everybody got this right. What the what they're trying to get to you here is the underlying pathology of uh, reperfusion syndrome with hyperkalemia, and so uh, sorry hyper um, yeah kalemia. And so um, what they're trying to do is what is the treatment for hyperkalemia in the acute setting uh, that'll both um, help with moving the uh, potassium around as well as stabilizing. Uh, the cardiac membrane as you are having um, cardiac abnormalities, and that's with the calcium. Um, insulin with glucose could be an option, but would be a much uh, slower way to do it. Uh, same thing with Lasix. Uh, so the fast um, way to treat this is with IV calcium. <clears throat> All right, next question. A 68-year-old, 64-year-old patient who underwent removal of an infected knee prosthetic presents to the emergency department with uh, right um, shoulder, neck, and back pain. He has been receiving IV antibiotics via a peripherally inserted central catheter, a pick in his right arm. Uh, upon presentation, the patient is found to have fever, leukocytosis, and tenderness overlying the venous route of the pick line. What is the next best step in management? A, removal of the pick line, B, broad spectrum antibiotics, C, therapeutic anticoagulation, D, venous duplex ultrasound, or E, prophylactic dose of anticoagulation. All right, great. I think just about everybody got these um, correct. So again, this is just a, a tenant of critical care. If you feel like you've got a catheter directed um, line infection or a clabsy, um, you wanna remove the line. And so that's step one is to get the pick line out. Um, you may get some varieties in this stem. They may ask you what the most common uh, bugs are uh, to treat. Um, and certainly if this patient is uh, 
uh, remains bacteremic or septicemic, they may require secondary antibiotics, but the uh, bugs would be Staphylococcus with uh, Enterobacter and uh, Strep um, being second and third uh, kind of in line. So um, really you gotta get the line out, um, treating with antibiotics and leaving your source, think of it as source control, um, doesn't help. <clears throat> or certainly not as helpful. Uh, 12 of 40, we only have a few more guys. Uh, Y'all are doing great um, and hopefully uh, going over some of the additional uh, stuff is helpful. 47 year old woman with a history of migraine headaches and with aura and left limb varicose veins is presented for microflebectomies and ultrasound guided foam square therapy. Two minutes after the procedure, while walking out of the room, she starts complaining of nausea, headache, and visual disturbances or scotomas. What could this patient's most likely underlying diagnosis be? A, allergic reaction to the sclerosin agent, B, vasovagal reaction, C, structural heart disease, D, common side effects seen with tumescent anesthesia, or E, conversion disorder. Okay, we're kind of all over the map here. So really whenever we're doing venous work and we're injecting these sclerosin agents, we're always the most concerned um, when you start to experience uh, arterial-like insufficiency uh, would be the presence of a PFO when you've had a, a venous to arterial embolization of the sclerosin agent. So th that's kind of number one. So A, um, no, that, that would be kind of a, you should be more concerned if your patients are developing neurologic symptoms after any sort of injection. Um, B is the correct answer. Um, C, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm off one. Um, A was allergic reaction. So that's very rare with the sclerosin agents that we use, and you would probably not get the symptoms that they're showing you. Um, you're not likely to get a vasovagal reaction. Uh, PFO is what they're getting at with the structural heart. Um, and then uh, D, um, you're not using um, tumescence when you're using a sclerosin agent like this. Um, and then uh, E um, is very, very, very low likelihood. So, okay, next question. <clears throat> Sorry, I got one off there on the stem there with you guys. All right, 13, a 20-year-old uh, woman presents to the office because she feels she has unsightly veins on her legs. Physical examination reveals telectasias scattered over her bilateral thighs and calves. Duplex ultrano uh, ultrasonography demonstrates no evidence of superficial or deep venous incompetence. What is the most appropriate treatment modality for this patient? Reassurance to the patient that no treatment uh, is necessary and that these veins will resolve on their own. B, injection sclerotherapy of the telectasias. C, endovenous saphenous sublation of the great and small saphenous veins because these veins are the source of the telectasias. Or D, uh, elastic compression stockings. Okay, good. So it looks like the only other uh, thing would be compression socks. So the only way to make the telangiectasias go away uh, is to sclerose them. Uh, they're not going to go away on their own, and they're not going to be caused by um, competent uh, superficial system, which is what they gave you. Um, the compression stockings will help with the larger diameter veins uh, and with incompetence, but it's not going to help with the um, overall telangiectasia. So it would be uh, injection is the uh, only right answer that they've given you here. Two more guys. 60 year old woman is experiencing left lower extremity swelling that has progressively gotten worse since her FEMPOP DVT five years ago and is causing her significant discomfort. At the time of her DVT, she was treated with anticoagulation. Her examination reveals hyperpigmentation of the skin below the knee, prominent varicosities on the medial side of the calf and three plus non-pitting edema of the lower leg, ankle and foot. Duplex ultrasonography demonstrates chronic post-thrombotic changes throughout the femoral and popliteal veins with reflux of greater than one second. The inferior vena cava and left common and external iliac veins are widely patent 
and without evidence of compression. The great saphenous and small saphenous veins are competent without reflux, and there are two to three millimeter varicosities with reflux in the calf. What is the best management for this patient's lower extremity edema? Okay, again, so we're kind of a, a little bit all over the place. So we'll kind of step through this, uh, just starting at the top. So end of venous ablation of the great and small saphenous veins. Um, this isn't going to help you as the patient has competent, it gives you in the stem, they're already competent, small saphenous, um, uh, great and small saphenous veins. So you don't want to take out uh, veins that are working well. This patient has signs of chronic post-thrombotic syndrome due to incompetence within the deep venous system. Um, kind of the same uh, vein of thought, um, pardon the pun, uh, with the foam sclerotherapy and stab um, phlebectomies of the refluxing varicosities. Um, uh, the contrast venogram, they've given you kind of the information um, that you need. They're telling you that uh, there's no residual, you know, chronic venous outflow obstruction within the iliac. Uh, there's no May Thurner type symptoms. So you're probably not going to gain a lot of information from the venogram. Certainly, if you had residual um, uh, venous outflow obstruction, that may be a viable option. This patient's going to be treated lifelong with compression therapy uh, and skin care. Um, and then certainly, if there was any incompetent perforators noted within areas of uh, prior ulceration, that would change your algorithm as far as treating those. And uh, you don't need a, uh, this is uh, not from a cardiac source uh, due to our history of prior DVT. Okay. Tough question there. All right, last question that we have. A 35-year-old uh, woman with a history of multiple prior miscarriages presents to the emergency department with a swollen, painful calf. She does not smoke and takes no medications. There is no inciting trauma, surgery, or immobilization. Duplex ultrasound reveals the presence of a femoral and popliteal vein thrombosis, and she has started on systemic anticoagulation. Laboratory analysis will most likely reveal the presence of which of the following. A, factor V line mutation, B, prothrombin gene mutation, C, antiphospholipid antibodies, D, protein C deficiency, or E, antithrombin 3 deficiency. Okay, <clears throat> so we kind of have a mix here. So you guys are along the, you know, thinking along the right track. Uh, there's definitely something going on. Um, up to a third of patients can have inherited disorders. So when you see this in young um, patients, you want to make sure that you work them up for hypercoagulable disorders. And then this just becomes a memorization of what the most common inherited um, uh, thrombophilia is, and that would be factor V Leiden mutation and that's in up to 50% of cases of thrombophilia. So the way this is worded uh, with the most likely there at the end, you'd have to go with factor V Leiden um, and uh, certainly the antiphospholipid um, in there is kind of a spoofer is probably a close second. So tough discriminator on that one. All right, guys, hopefully that was helpful. I know that um, you know, the vascular stuff is, is tough sometimes with y'all, depending on what kind of exposure you get. But uh, hopefully this review helps with some very common questions that you're likely to see moving forward. I'd like to invite all the panelists to uh, quickly turn on their cameras, if you would. Dr. Fortuna, thank you so much for uh, leading us through that excellent review of vascular. That was uh, a lot of tough questions in there, and your explanations were right on target. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to give a big thanks really to all the panelists who volunteered their time to uh, participate in the AppSite webinar this evening. I think it was another tremendous success. 
Uh, I also want to thank all the participants for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here with us tonight. Uh, I know the app site can be pretty stress inducing, but uh, you know, we're here to support you and, and guide you through this every year. Uh, I want to thank the SAGE's staff for really uh, putting on a very smooth webinar this evening uh, for us, so thank you. And these webinars are constantly working to improve based on your feedback. I would ask that uh, you please take a moment to um, uh, participate in the survey that was posted in the chat section of your Zoom window. It doesn't take long, but I do read every single one of the feedback comments that you give us, and we make modifications every year based on that feedback. So please take a few moments to do that. Um, I also want to um, uh, uh, let you know that we will have these uh, sessions recorded, and in a couple of days, they will be posted to the uh, SAGE's website. Uh, I think Ed uh, posted uh, a, a note about that in the chat as well, but that's going to go to the um, uh, Sage's website, and uh, Ed, if we can confirm that that poll or that survey has been posted, uh, that would be great. Uh, we will send that out to to everybody as well as soon as that is uh, is posted. Um, the next Sage's uh, webinar is coming up in February. This is a webinar on the use of flexible endoscopy, particularly in community-based uh, hospitals. So we look forward to you participating in that. In the meantime, um, really wish everybody the best of health, the best of safety during these uh, turbulent times. Please take care of yourselves and each other. And finally, good luck once again on the app site. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good night.